I'm Jack Theakston, and here's a look at the work our team did for a fabulous Fleischer restoration. Christmas comes but once a year. After three years of an exclusive contract with the Walt Disney Company, the Technicolor Corporation made their three-color printing process available to the studios in September of 1935. Four months later, in January of the following year, the Fleischers released their first three-color Technicolor cartoon, Somewhere in Dreamland. Christmas Comes But Once a Year is the seventh color classic made by the Fleischers in 1936, and their final color short released that year. What set Technicolor's three color process apart from other color systems was that it recorded and printed all colors in the spectrum. The company's previous two color process was limited to only red and green light, missing out on anything that was blue or purple. With a newly designed camera that would record red, green, and blue light on three separate strips of film, Technicolor was able to achieve a completely natural color image. Prints were made with a process called dye transfer, in which prints of the color records have their emulsions etched to create strips of thousand foot long stamps for each primary color, cyan, magenta, and yellow. These stamps, or matrices, are pressed up against blank film one after the other. This process is not unlike the way a four color printing press makes a color image on paper. Each color is stamped one on top of the other until a full color image is finished. The Fleischers used a technique that would eventually become the standard for animating in Technicolor. Using a rotating wheel on the front of the camera, individual exposures of the color image were taken through red, green, and blue filters. These color records were exposed sequentially on the negative and then taken to Technicolor where they were developed and optically printed into three color matrices for printing. We were extremely fortunate to have access to the original successive exposure camera negative for this project, courtesy of the Paramount Archive. 4K DPX scans were made at Paramount and delivered to me. At this point, I separated the red, green, and blue records into discrete timelines and recombined them digitally. Once combined, a flat, ungraded copy was ready for restoration. What we were left with was a full-width scan of the image with information that would have been cropped out in printing and projection. While this image was never meant to be seen by the public, we can glean out a great deal of information about how the Fleischers animated their cartoons. During photography, three cameras were used to photograph separate animation sequences. One camera used an aperture plate that was standard in the sound era, blocking out the left portion of the image that would eventually be taken up by the optical soundtrack used for playing back the audio. However, two of the cameras used the more traditional silent aperture, exposing a full image on the top and bottom and the left side that would normally be used by the soundtrack. The Fleischers used a patented photography process in which an animation stand was mounted horizontally in front of painted sets made of plaster and wood. Combining solid stop motion animation with traditional cell animation, this trademark style was known as their stereo optical process or simply the Fleischer process. The full width scan of the opening Fleischer process shot of the orphanage shows a number of details not seen in the final print. On the left portion of the image, we can see the raw plywood that was used to manufacture the set, as well as the large purple blob in the upper left-hand corner, a defect from using a wide-angle lens in conjunction with the color filter wheel. A number of shots show the edge of the platen frame of the animation stand and show the animated zooms onto the stand in photography. Multiple shots show cell smudging, but as that was apparent in the original photography, we left it in. On a number of shots, including the opening titles, one can see the registration pins for the glass fit on top of the artwork, and backgrounds more or less stop being painted on a number of shots. The edge of the animation table during the Fleischer process finale can also be seen. While in theory, what was photographed should simply drop into place with level adjustments, this was not the case. Using multiple cameras and with the rolls of exposed stock being processed in different development baths at different times, grading had to be done on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. A few shots, such as this one, were overexposed in photography and had to be adjusted back. This shot was underexposed and we did our best we could to bring back some of the lost detail in the shadows. One piece of original artwork has survived and was made available to us. One of the interesting details about this showed that the Fleischer artists made very exacting color selections based on how the art would photograph, not how it would look in person. Note, for example, the green bricks on the fireplace that became more muted in the final product. Oh, <laughs> Audio was scanned at Deluxe Laboratories in Burbank. The original track was solid and needed very little work. 
Once the audio was synced to the graded master, the file was sent to Thad Komarowski, who meticulously cleaned up every speck of negative dirt, every scratch, judiciously deflickered messy 80-year-old lab work, and stabilized portions of the film that were jumpy due to camera malfunction or negative shrinkage. The end result is a product that looks better than it was released in 1936. I hope you found this look at film restoration informative, and please do check out more fabulous Fleischer restorations on their YouTube channel.